All right, Hosea chapter 13 tonight. We are winding down our study of the book of Hosea. And this chapter is a description of what was going to happen to Israel as a result of the nation. As we discussed last week, having provoked God to anger most bitterly. And this chapter really serves as a commentary or further explanation as to how God was going to return into Israel their reproach through the form of divine punishment, as we've observed, that would occur at the hands of the Assyrians. However, this chapter again will show a glimpse at the return of a remnant and a glimpse of the redemption from sin and ultimately death that was to come uh, through Jesus the Christ, our Savior. And the point that we should see from our study of this chapter for ourselves today is this. A life lived separate and apart from God, a life lived in constant rebellion to God is a life of foolishness, futility, and hopelessness because ultimately it's going to lead to one experiencing God's wrath in the day of judgment. And thus our only hope in this life is to trust God and submit our lives to His will fully. And as we approach this chapter, you would note on your outline that we are looking at it from three main points. In the first main point, which deals with Israel's destruction, it takes up the majority of the chapter, verses 1 through 13. Uh, Verse 14, we will see Israel's figurative resurrection. And then finally, we'll come back to a picture of the judgment that God was going to pour out upon Israel and see God describing the desolation that was going to occur in the land. And so as we begin, if someone would, let's go ahead and read the first 13 verses at this time. Let's get this big chunk of reading out of, what, out of the way. If someone would, read verses 1 through 13 for us of, of chapter 13. And Ephraim spoke trembling, exalted himself in Israel. But when he offended the rebellion worship, he died. Now let's sing more and more. And made for themselves golden images, idols of their silver, according to their skill. All of it is the work of craftsmen. They said to them, Let the men who sacrifice kiss the calves. Therefore, they shall be like a morning cloud, and like the early dew that passes away, like chaff blown off from a pressure pool, and like smoke from a chimney. Yet I am the Lord your God, ever since the land of Egypt, and you shall know no God but me. For there is no Savior besides me. I knew you in the wilderness and the land of great drought. When they had passed through, they were filled. They were filled and their heart was exalted. Therefore, they forgot me. So I will meet them like a lion, like a liver by the note I will work. I will meet them like a bear in the pride of their cubs. I will turn over the rib cages, and there I will devour them like a lion. The wild beasts shall tear them. O Israel, you are destroyed, but your help is from me. I will be your king, where is any other that may that he may save you in all of your sins. And your judges to whom you said, give me a king and princes. I gave your king in my anger and took him away in my wrath. The iniquity of Ephraim is bound up. His sin is stored up. The sorrows of a woman and child are shall come upon him. He is an idolized son, for he should not stay long for children born. All right, thank you, Brother Keith. First of all, as we look at this section, verses 1 and 2 really deal with Israel's deterioration. Now, you would note in verse number 1, God, refer, God makes specific mention of Ephraim. And here we see something regarding Ephraim's past. Past. When you go back to Genesis 48, and you look at verses 18 through 20, you will find that Ephraim had been blessed by Jacob above Manasseh. And then when you look at Judges chapter 8, verses 11, as well as chapter 12, you would find that Ephraim stood tall among the tribes, all 12 tribes of Israel, during the period of the Judges. And in fact, which tribe did the first king of Israel come from? Saul? Um, Benjamin? Yes. From Benjamin. Uh, Ephraim, though, however, as we we look at all of this, enjoyed, well, the rest of the tribes, you you go back to the period of the judges, you will find that enjoyed an exalted position. And at times when Ephraim spoke, the other tribes listened with respect and fear or trembling. Now, you look at the, the present here. 
uh, Ephraim, and I, and I would suggest standing for the nation, uh, they signed their own death warrant, did they not? And how did, how did they commit spiritual suicide? And I think that's what we see throughout the book. Well, there you go, Brother Keith, by their idolatry. And, uh, and as such, Ephra, they, they continued their headlong plunge into sin. In fact, when Jeroboam came to the throne there in 1 Kings 12, you will find that it just really exacerbated the problem when he introduced the golden calves at Dan and Bethel. And the application for today is this. When one really steps into sin, that sin calls for more and more. And as a result, when one becomes so accustomed to living in sin, they can scare, it's hard for them to change, is it not? And isn't that what the problem we face in our society today is? People have become accustomed to living sinful lifestyles. And if you become accustomed to living a lot sinful lifestyle, what's going to happen after a while? There you go. You're going to have to, it's going to take more and more to satisfy you. And ultimately, one will allow their heart to become hardened and their conscience is seared, as it were, with a hot iron so that they are past feeling. And this is in order to, to satisfy their fleshly lusts. You think about Israel's problem. It, they started out with only two idols. But as time went on, more and more idols sprung up throughout the land. And, uh, and really, idolatry became nationwide. Now, the phrase here in verse 2, to kiss the calves, indicates the reverence, the homage, the worship that was given to these idols. The devo- it, it indicates the devotion that Israel ha- had to these false gods rather than to the Almighty God, the one who had brought them into the land. And so that's their deterioration. When you look at verses 3 through 8, now we find God really denouncing their behavior. Look at verse 3. God here declares the punishment. And here God's pronunciation of judgment is described in in three figures. Notice this. They shall be as the morning cloud and the early dew that passeth away. What does this signify? Weakness. Well, weakness. Mm-hmm. Weakness, a passing thing. How long is the dew on the ground? Not long. It goes away quick. It's not strong. And so Israel would disappear from the, from the scene as quickly as the morning dew disappears from the ground and as the morning cloud passes away. Now look, look at the second figure given here. As the chaff that is driven with the whirlwind out of the floor. Now... What does this signify? Why does God give us the, the, the illustration of Israel being like the chaff? Again, he's long away. It's useless and worthless. It's, you, yeah, exactly, Brother Keith. In the face of, it, helpless in the face of judgment. As, you know, the, the weightless chaff is helpless in the face of a strong and violent wind, is it not? When a wind comes, it's just going to pick it up and scatter it. And so God's judgment, when God came in judgment on Israel in the form of the Assyrians, well, Israel, it would be like they, that, that they would be like the chaff, and the Assyrians would be like that strong and violent wind. Scatter them here, there, and yonder. And then you also have the third figure here as the smoke out of the chimney. Again, what does, what does this impress upon our minds? Why would God use this picture? What's that? It's brief, but for a moment. Brief, but for a moment. Yeah. Exactly. You know that. Just as a sm- just as smoke disappears from the chimney, well, here you're going to have Israel disappearing from the scene. And this conveys, does this not convey the severity of the judgment that Israel was going to have to endure as a result of their sin? And God, and we have these interesting illustrations to try to convey, to impress upon Israel the foolishness of not turning back to God. 
Now ultimately there's something far worse that awaits man, is there not? And that's hell. You know, that you know, you think this is bad now. Wait, you tr- you you try eternity in hell, that's far worse. So here we have the punishment declared. Now, verses 4 through 6 we have the reason as to why they were going to be punished. Who had they offended? God. They had offended God. And uh, you look at how, look at what he says here. I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt. Now what's God trying what is God what, what is God trying to get across here with this phrase? Hey, I there you go, Brother Keith. He's reminding them, I'm the one who brought you out. Me, by my powerful hand. Not these idols. Remember what Jeroboam attributed to those golden calves when he set them up in Dan and Bethel? What did he tell Israel about those, about those calves? Did he not say that Here, Israel, is the gods that delivered you from Egypt. He hoodwinked them. And they gave in and they they committed sin with these idols. You know, it's... I mean, to even think about it, it's it's absolutely ridiculous. It is. I mean, here, I've created this idol, and now it's my God. Mm -hmm. I'm going to bow down and worship what I created with my own hands. Yep. In... uh, they had made their own god, and now they were gonna—they were gonna find their gods couldn't deliver them. You think man tries still tries to build his own gods? Oh yeah, build your own rel- <laughs> Builds his own. Washington last week. What's that? They weren't still Washington last week. Yeah. Well, I would suggest to you the you know, atheists, atheism, humanism. You know, the idea behind those movements is man is his own god. Man is the measure. So he makes himself his own God. And yet in times of trouble, can he deliver himself? Absolutely not. And there's a variety of ways in which man can be guilty of this today. And certainly, without God on our side, we are, we're in a helpless predicament, are we not? You know, if, think about this, Romans 8, 31. If God be for us, who can be against us? Or you think about... Or you think about the converse of that. If God be against us, who can be for us? And the, and the answer is no one. And, um, you know, I was just told here through my video, Brother Donald Underwood observed, that Micah, you go to the book of Judges, you will find that Micah built his own house of gods. So you see the problem throughout Israel's history, even prior to, to, to Jeroboam's instituting the idols in Dan and Bethel. It goes all the way back to, to the days of the judges with Micah. And, and again, the problem really started at Sinai with the demand to Aaron to make, make them a golden calf. But we see how far this problem took Israel. They were so attached to their idols. And, um, and again, look at this here, here as well in verse 4. Thou shalt know no God but me. This sounds like one of the Ten Commandments, does it not? What, what did God tell Israel? Shall have no other gods before me. And what had happened? Oh, they, they had a lot of other gods before Jehovah God. Now, does God have room for second place in one's life? No. Israel's, Israel tried that. And God told them, you know... It's wrong, sinful. And thus Israel's allegiance was to their idols. And for this, God God was offended, and he had a right to be offended. And and, and again, you look at verse 6 here as well. And again, as Brother Keith pointed out, you know, I did know thee in the wilderness in the land of great drought and drought. You know, in the face of God's gracious provisions to Israel. Israel became lifted up with pride, even though Israel had seen the miracles. She saw the plagues that God brought down upon Egypt. She witnessed the parting of the Red Sea. Israel, the nation, saw that that God provided for their every need in the wilderness with the food, the shelter, the, 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 the miraculous provision of the manna. And for all of this, Israel was ungrateful. 
you know, and as a result, this is very telling. What, the, what are the last two words of this verse? they forgotten God. Because they had a, their heart was exalted. Yeah. I think one point that God is making here is He says, you know, in, in the time of drought, you were faithful, basically. Yeah. But then, when things got good and you became prosperous, you forgot me. Oh, oh, yes. I wonder if prosperity is about to be a, a big blessing, you know. Well, think about our nation. Think about our nation. Difficult times, what happens? Remember 9-11? What happened? What did everyone decide to do after that happened? Pray to God. Pray to God. We, got, we, we need to pray to God. Well, how long did that last? Not long. Well, when things got better, we, you know, people say, oh, we, we don't need God. We got it good here. We don't need God. So that's the, pro, you know, prosperity can, you know. It's not necessarily that way. It's not, look at Abraham. Right. Abraham was rich. Well, look at Job as well. Job was a wealthy man. So it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. But it's it the be. attitude toward it. It can be. It's the attitude if we allow ourselves to become hooked on material things. The love of money is the root of all kinds, sorts of evil. And, of course, stems from a covetous mindset. And, again, covetousness is, is idolatry. But, um, you know, when present danger passes... You know, one can easily and quickly forget the one who aids them. You know, again, as we just observed, we can forget God just as quickly. You know, Israel forgot God. They thought in the promised land they had all they needed and wanted. And so they prospered and forgot God. They, be they became self-sufficient, did they not? Thinking, well, we got this. We don't need God. I can handle things my way, not God's way. And well, they found out that didn't work out too well now, did it? And they were going to pay the price. Look at verses 7 and 8 now, the description of the punishment. Here again, we're seeing some very vivid illustrations given by, by God through the prophet as to what was going to happen to Israel. Look, you know, look at this. You know, first of all, God would be unto them as a lion in them. Um, they would be as they were attacked by a lion. Now, now why would God you choose the figure of a lion? What is a lion? Sometimes referred to as a king of thieves. He's powerful uh, by yourself without weapons. You're, not Ooh, you're in trouble. A lion, you know, king of beasts, you know, it's predator. You know, there's a reason why... Is that not a reason enough as to why God would describe Satan as being a roaring lion that walketh about seeking whom he may devour? What's going to happen if we're by ourselves and having to face Satan? Not, not going to be a happy outcome. And that's why we have to be sober, be vigilant, and, you know, lean upon God, lean upon his word, you know, pray. So that we can overcome our adversary, the devil. But here, God uses a figure in the form of judgment. He would be as a lion unto them. And he also says that as a leopard, by the way, will I observe or I will stalk them. You know, and, and what, isn't that what a leopard does, stalks its prey? Sort of lays in wait, observing and of course, a lion would do that too, do, do they not? And, um, and, and the picture here is that this punishment is going to be vicious and unrelenting. Certainly, it would be very violent in nature. And further, it would be as if they had been set upon by a bear who had lost her cubs. Now, now what, you know, what happens if you get mama bear mad? Going to attack you. Now, ladies, what happens if so someone, what would you do if someone went after your children? What are you going to do? She's going to attack them. Oh, yes. Yeah, you know, you know, you know, you take a woman, you take attack a mother's children, you're, you, you're on her bad side. And so the picture here is, you know, it, it, what's going to happen is, 
Is it going to be like a, a, a female bear who had lost her cub? She is going to be in a foul, foul mood. She's not going to be a happy camper. The nation then would be devoured as a lion devours its prey and would be torn asunder, as it were, like a wild beast tears its prey asunder. And uh, none would, there would be no one who would be able to help them. And, uh, and the reason being was they had rejected the one alone who, who could help them, <coughs> that being God. Now, verses 9 through 12, we have here Israel's self-destruction. And um, we're moving quickly through the chapter tonight because mainly because this is really a summation of what has been previously said. This is really summing everything up and explaining further what was going to happen. And uh, look at verse number 9. Look at the first phrase here. Who was to blame for this predicament? Israel. Israel. What is, you know, God tells them, Israel, you've destroyed yourself. You've, it's, it's your fault, Israel. You know, question. Who is to blame if one dies in a lost condition? Themselves. Themselves. But having said that, mm -hmm. there are still people in the world who have never heard God. Right. And it's, our responsibility it's our responsibility to see that as many people as possible Exactly. And, you know, with, uh, with all the congregations of the Lord's church, all, you know, all over the world, you, you know, and with the means by which the gospel can be disseminated, we can get the gospel into all the world. Can we not? What's that? There you go. Going into all the world tonight, you know, via Internet, via the printed page, via, you know, the technology we have at our disposal today is amazing, is it not? tools to get the gospel out there to get the word of god out there but if those but if people choose to willingly reject god they have no one to blame but themselves now do they and um and, and god's not to blame and this is affirmed to us in second peter 3 verse 9 is it not god is not willing that any should perish does god want a single individual to die lost no he's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. God would have all men to be saved, come to knowledge of the truth. And again, in order to avoid perishing, we have to submit our lives to God. Israel, could Israel have avoided this fate? Yeah, as we've observed time and again, God sent them prophet after prophet after prophet. And what was the basic message of the prophets? To repent, but then the message turned to judgment. For their refusal to repent. Because God didn't want to destroy His people. He didn't want His people to die, to be destroyed. And He wants none to be destroyed. But certainly those who reject God, who reject His, His, His message, well, that, well, they've destroyed themselves. I would suggest you could preach a pretty good lesson on that phrase, destroying oneself. The surefire way to destroy oneself, you know, Close your ears to God. You know, don't believe His Word. And as Christians today, we can destroy ourselves. How do we do that? Don't study His Word. Don't pray. Don't worship Him. Don't do anything, I guess you might, you might sum it up in a nutshell, correct? You know, we can destroy ourselves, and that's what, I that's what Israel had done. And you also notice here, God contrasts this with, but in me is thine help. And, uh, you know, to reject God is to reject the one who desires to help us, you know, with our most difficult of problems, including sin. God can help mankind's sin problem, can he not? He's provided the means. But when man rejects it, he's rejecting God's help, is he not? But why would anyone, why does people, why do, I guess let's, let's, Ask this question. What motivates men to reject God? Lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. That's number one. Just don't want to listen. Confidence in self. Confidence in self. Number two. 
Even though God has already said it's not in man that walketh to direct his own steps, but man says, I can do it. So you take that confidence in self, then you have a lack of knowledge. What else? Confidence in material things. Confidence in material things. Well, Israel's demonstrating all of these, are they not? And this, this is why mankind needs, men everywhere need to study the Old Testament, especially the prophets. Because we're dealing with some of the same problems today we're seeing were faced by the prophets then, only in different forms. So the message is all time relevant. The problem is when man rejects God, he refuses help, thinking he can help himself when he, when he really can't help himself. He needs God. We need God at all times. In the study, particularly the prophets, we see, we see God's love for the people in sending the prophets to yep. attempt to persuade them to repent. But we also see the fact that He's a just God, that He eventually punishment is going to come. Exactly. You know, and that's what we, you know, that's a great illustration, Brother Keith. You know, throughout the prophets, we see God's goodness and His severity. You, can, you know, there's two sides to God. We cannot, you, can, you know, we cannot exclude, preach one to the exclusion of the other. We can't preach all the goodness of God without preaching the severity, nor can we just simply focus on His severity without focusing on His goodness as well. You know, the, it, you know and goodness and severity. That's joined together by God, and what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. However, what God desired, look at verse 10. What did God desire to be to Israel, according to the first part of this verse? I want to be your king. In other words, God demanded to have the preeminence in their hearts, their lives. He he, He wanted to be the ruler. He also wanted to be their savior as well. Exactly, Brother Keith. He wanted to be their savior as well. And the same principle is true today, is it not? God, want, God demands to rule over our lives. He's to have the preeminence in our lives, but He also wants to be our Savior. But how's the only way He's going to save us and rule our lives? What's it going to take on our part? Our submission to Him. Obedience. Our submission to Him. You know, we have to humble ourselves before God. And, and, and as mankind, that's the hardest thing for us to do, is it not? It's to humble ourselves in the sight of God. And again, I've said it before and I'll say it again now. There's a reason why the Beatitudes on the Sermon on the Mount starts off with blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's the only way we can enter the kingdom is by humbling ourselves before God. However, if we humble ourselves before God, what's He going to do? He'll lift us up. You see, the way up, the way up is down, is it not? So we need to go down in order to go up. And that's what Israel refused to do. It's like Jesus said in the parable, basically, that when you go into a feast, don't assume that you're supposed to take the high seat. You take the low seat. Then whoever given it comes up to you and says, Oh, friend, move up. Mm -hmm. Instead of you take the high seat, friend, you need to go back down. Right. Parable of the chief seats. Exactly. That's a great illustration of what we're talking about here, Brother Keith. And so, so we must trust and rely, rely upon God by, by our yielding our wills to His perfect will. However, what did Israel demand? Did Israel want God as their king? Oh, they wanted the king to be like the nations. And we're very familiar with the situation. Remember, God t- Samuel heard the... Pro- re- Samuel heard the, the, the demand. He was angry, but God told him, they haven't rejected you. They've, they've rejected me. And, um, you know, the, they didn't want God as their king. They wanted to be like the world, did they not? And isn't, isn't that the ever-present danger for us as Christians today, the threat of becoming like the world? If we become like the world, what's going to happen? We're going to be lost. Yeah, there, there, there are a whole lot of congregations of the Lord's Church that have drifted into this, uh, forming uh, uh, associations with the denominational world. They're yep. worshiping the denominational world. I'm thinking, that's okay, we're just, you know. Mm-hmm. 
or seeking to, to be like the denominational world, parroting them. And it's sad to see the digression from the, from, the, from the perfect will of God, is it not? Things you never would have imagined to see. I, you know, there's places in the brotherhood where they're allowing women to preach publicly. They're allow, there's places allow women to preach publicly. Obviously, there are some congregations that are, have started using instru- mechanical instruments in their worship. They're rejecting God because they want to be like the world. However, we're not to be like the world. We're to be different, peculiar. We are to be holy as God is holy. And certainly, we are warned because, about this because the entire period of the monarchy, especially in the northern kingdom, was... Was there any good king in the north? No. Now in the south, there was a few good kings, like Hezekiah and Josiah, but to the north, there, there wasn't one. And so how did God respond? Well, they were angry. Look at this. God tells Israel what? Verse 11. He gave them a king in what? So this explains 1 Samuel 8 and following, does it not? So, so this tells us that God was angry with Israel when they made that demand, but it was in his anger that he granted their request. And, it, and it's like God saying, well, if this is what you want, here's what you, you're going to get it. You're going to get it full bore. And consequently, because they continued in their idolatry, what, would God, what was God going to do? And now notice this. He's speaking as if it's already happened. And with God, it has. God did what in his wrath? Took him away. Took him away. Again, God, you know, he gave them what they wanted, but because of their sin, he gave them that, but he took their, their kings away. And in fact, the nation never again would have an earthly king to reign over them, even when the remnant came out of captivity. You look at verse number 12, This, you, you know, you see the problem here. The iniquity of Ephraim is bound up. His sin is hid. Again, she viewed herself as having no sin, but she could not conceal it from God. God had bound up the record of the nation's conduct as a cloth to preserve it so as not to be lost, and as such, every sin of the nation would be recompensed in in the form of judgment at the hands uh, of the Assyrian armies. Again, you know, God God was going to... Reward them for their evil doing. And uh, look at verse 13. Here's an interesting verse. And, uh, you know, the sorrows of a tra- travailing woman shall come upon him. Now, what, what's, what's God trying to get across here? What's the point of this? They would suffer the pangs of tra- travail and sorrow. You're exactly right, Sister Carolyn, by way of their impending punishment. You're going to have to go through this. And it's going to be horrible. It's going to be terrible. But yet you're going to find there's hope. Someone would read verse 14. Here we find Israel's resurrection. All right, thank you, Sister Carolyn. And so God here promises to ransom or redeem Israel from the power of death, Sheol, the land of death of the grave. Though the nation would go into captivity, suffer the pangs of travail and sorrow, there would be a remnant that would return. God would deliver them from their captivity. And and again, their restoration would be as a birth, as it were, and a resurrection. And again, you see similar language in greater detail in Ezekiel chapter 37 with the vision of the, of the dry bones. God raising up those dry bones back to life. Now, God's not promising them captivity would not come, but offers hope for the future. He would not renege on his promises, especially to Abraham. Remember the Abrahamic promise of the promised seed to come. He would keep them, fulfill them. And uh, ransom is from the wor- Hebrew word padah, meaning to redeem by payment or price. And uh, redeem is from gal, meaning to redeem by right of kin- kinship. And, you know, speaks of a kin- kinsman redeemer. 
Is, is verse 14 perhaps a messianic prophecy? Yeah. In its, in its ultimate sense, it is. Speaking, looking down the line to, 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 to when Christ would come. He would become, and Christ became man's near kinsman in his incarnation. And, uh, and he's our kinsman redeemer in that he, he makes it possible to escape sin by purchasing us with his blood. Uh, and you, know, you have the passages. And... Um, uh, the deeper meaning of these words are brought to light by Christ's own resurrection, uh, thus guaranteeing our victory over death and the grave and our resurrection from the dead. And you have, this, you have the passages on your outline. And, um, and uh, you know, the idea of repentance shall, not, shall be hid is God's not changing His mind. He will fulfill His purpose of redemption. As the judgment against Israel was irreversible and irrevocable, so too is redemption and deliverance from Sheol. And then verses 15 and 16, here we have Israel's desolation. And again, it's a picture of returning to to the national judgment that was going to come after a glance at the distant redemption. And and verse 16 sums it up, really. Samaria shall become desolate, for she hath rebelled against her God. And and this is why the land was going to be desolate. This is why that punishment was going to come upon Israel. It's because of the idolatry, because of her sin and refusal to repent. And, and so it is. As we noted, Hosea 13 reiterates much of what has been previously said in the book regarding Israel's sin. It really sums everything up, does it not, this particular chapter? And as such, it sets the stage for a final plea on the part of Jehovah God from the prophet Hosea to his rebellious nation to repent in chapter 14. And chapter 14 is one of the most beautiful passages in all the Old Testament, in all the whole Bible. And so next week we'll begin looking at, we'll look at chapter 14.